Hello everyone. Good afternoon from Brussels. of EUA's uh, annual conference series. You know, we were uh, just as ready for the we have um, two our annual conference the last week in Gdansk. Uh, Instead, we are now through the webinar that were supposed to take place last week. And uh, right now, um, this is the second webinar. The topic of this webinar is uh, promoting university societal engagement. And we have uh, two different perspectives to societal engagement. Remotely. A uh, couple of uh, practices go into the uh, topic itself, presentation. This uh, uh, webinar will be recorded. Um, you can uh, look at it uh, from EUA's YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, you, uh, after this uh, webinar, anyway, you get a link to the course. This part of it, you can still look at it afterwards at your or and we will be promoting it for other audiences afterwards. In the same email, you will also get the things that our speakers have proposed to you. One of a sneak peek to the topic. Um, as many of you have already noted, because you're saying hello to us in chat, in the of the screen, you can see a talk where you can take part in this session. Uh, please feel free to put on the topic, which we will be end of discussion to inform the population. Uh, and next one, which is to have two, two friends, Nezam Abriyic Samartia, the rector of the University of Rijeka in Croatia, who will be presenting together with Ninoslav Sukanet Schmidt, director from the Institute for the Development of Education. They have been working on a European framework uh, for community engagement. Specifically, the University of Rijeka has been piloting it. And they will be taught to become more impactful in a society. Then we move to a completely different uh, topic, which is Orla, Orla, Orla Duke's uh, yeah. presentation. Uh, she is a program manager from uh, Scholars Europe based in the University in Ireland, right now at home as we inspire Europe and in the experiences promoting my name is development at the my name is the floor to the speaker. That is about the framework of the session and the practicalities. Um, I think we were ready to move to the first presentation. So I, I give the floor to Nino to talk about the, the engagement that you've been developing. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dia, for an opportunity to present a need for a European framework for community engagement in uh, higher education that should support uh, universities in institutionalizing their uh, connection or cooperation with the wider uh, community. So in our presentation, 
We will speak about definitions and challenges related to community engagement. We'll present uh, the framework that we have developed and the University of Rijeka will present its experience in piloting the framework. Um, this is uh, the presentation developed as part of the pan-European Erasmus Plus project towards a European framework for community engagement in higher education or TEFSI. And our large consortium uh, is led by our Institute for the Development of Education in Croatia and Technical University in Dresden. But as you can see, we have uh, partners all around uh, Europe within the uh, local uh, government and then university sector like in Rijeka, Dublin, Twente, Ghent, um, in Catalonia, uh, Spain, Dresden, and uh, two university uh, networks of innovative uh, universities. Um, community engagement is emerging uh, as a policy priority in higher education, and we define it as a process whereby universities engage with community stakeholders to undertake joint activities that are mutually beneficial. Community refers to a broad range of external university stakeholders and our emphasis is on those communities with fewer resources. Uh, like NGOs, social enterprises, cultural organizations, schools, local governments, or even citizens. However, uh, policy priorities in higher education still focus on excellence, global league tables, on forms of engagement that have uh, more tangible economic benefits and are easier to measure. However, a community engagement is resistant to being measured. Therefore, our TEFSI approach in developing a European framework is that we drop the search for the perfect quantitative indicators of community engagement. We reject the logic of ranking. We avoid a bureaucratic self-assessment process. And we decided to learn from previous tools, but we propose a new approach with a new set of principles that underlay our European framework. So the first principle is authenticity of engagement because we provide community with a meaningful role and tangible benefits in the process. Second, empowerment of individuals because we recognize and award individual efforts uh, within the university and in uh, the community. Third, bottom up rather than top-down steering because the toolbox, which is a part of the framework, is based on mapping stories of practitioners that provides both university staff and the community with a say in the process. And fourth is learning journey rather than benchmarking because our toolbox results in a qualitative discovery of good practices which are achieved through a collaborative learning process. So uh, we have six stages of the implementation of the toolbox, which is a part of the framework. And it all starts with a quick scan, which is an initial discussion about the extent of community engagement at the university. Second, evidence collection of stories of community engaged practitioners. Third, mapping, which is a usage of a TEFSE toolbox matrix to map the level of community engagement. Self-reflection, which is an open discussion among university management, staff, students, and the community, and it all results in an institutional report, which is a basis for further action. We have developed a theoretical framework that basically underlies our uh, European framework with, as you can see, five key concepts for which we have developed five levels. And community engagement as a concept and a set of actions could range uh, from being, as you can see, transactional to transformational, from collaborative betterment to collaborative empowerment. And the progress uh, across these sequences depends on producing mutual benefits for both a university and community. We have seven dimensions, teaching, research, service, students, staff, and uh, management. Um, and um, for instance, uh, the dimension related to teaching 
One example could be, for instance, service learning. So for each uh, dimension, we have developed a number of sub-dimensions, and then we need to assign a level of engagement for each sub-dimension based on the collected practices uh, in uh, uh, during uh, the collection of good practices. And we synthesize each dimension with a heat map, which represents intensity, intensity of different types of engagement at a university. So this is uh, the short description of the framework. And our um, partner, University of Rijeka, has piloted our framework. And now the rector will share their experience in applying the framework. Hello to everybody. I hope that you can hear me. So I just want to say at the beginning that I'm definitely very much happy and pleased that I have the opportunity to participate in this webinar and I will immediately continue. So uh, the experiences from the University of Rijeka, I just want to say at the beginning that we are not the only university at which this toolbox is pilot, uh, actually was piloted. So beside Rijeka, uh, it was piloted also in Dresden, Twente and Dublin, very comprehensive uh, process. And but it is much, this is the most important thing is actually that the quality of the toolbox is that definitely confirmed. So just uh, before I'll try to before I, I, I try to, to explain to you the toolbox, just to explain our motivation as the university to join to this project and to this uh, process. So what is actually the, our motivation for uh, uh, for social engagements or why community engaged universities? So according to our opinion, the community engaged university will be the universities of future. So we relied actually in our conviction on the crucial documents from the Paris Communique from the 2080, also the famous LAMI report, LabFab, up uh, or the policy reports, uh, GRC uh, policy reports. In all these documents, but not only in uh, these documents, it's always repeated that the universities of future will be the collaborative universities, the, the universities that are, that are actually aware of the role of higher education in securing a sustainable future. The university that are open to the world or the university who will actually be financing also, you know, in accordance with their regional innovation impact and uh, public engagement. So we are very much aware that the European Commission, but also EUA vision is the vision uh, how to develop how to diversify you know the academic inputs in accordance with the values so there is the motto of the new strategy of eua this is a strong universities for europe and we strongly believe that the strong universities for europe is actually the community engaged university who uh, respect the eu values between others integrity inclusivity diversity sustainability solidarity and the other so, uh, concerning the piloting uh, process, uh, Nino mentioned uh, uh, the steps, but just to, to say that we have the two main phases, let us say the phase of a report. So we prepare during the two months, very sophisticated uh, report. We analyzed 45 practices at our university within the framework of seven dimensions and 21 sub dimensions on more than 50 pages so you know and we created a heat map nino presented to use for uh, to you for each this sub dimension so when we finish this report, uh, uh, we organized, uh, not we, but uh, the, the project in the, in the framework of the project is organized the piloting visit today for external, external experts, but very, very comprehensive uh, uh, conversation with a lot of stakeholders from the university and the local, local community. Just to illustrate some of our examples, uh, some of our practices that we actually elaborated in our, our our report so uh, we are very proud and this is uh, let, let us say the speciality of our our university we have the research and development centers so it's very unique 
practice at our university. So the centers that actually are the mission of these centers is to develop the research and education completely devoted to the development of the local community, and not only local, but the regional community. For instance, so we presented and elaborated there the work of our Center for Industrial Heritage or the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies or the Center for Advanced Computing and Modeling, Artificial Intelligence, uh, Urban Transition, and some, some others. And also some other uh, of our practices, for instance, we have the citizens portal, actually portal we created in our university, uh, European University network, UFA, that connect the citizens and academicians. Uh, we also present and analyze there our university for third age, our very famous educational program for the silver generation, also our core student and community that actually prepare our students for the future community-based uh, projects. After all this, you know, and the piloting in which we were uh, directly included, we got finally the report from the experts. And this is actually a kind of slit a slip dot analysis. You can notice here that this is not a SWOT analysis, but very similar to the SWOT analysis. But you know, we missed here the 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 the, the we w. This is a weakness, and the idea of this toolbox is actually to develop uh, to to try to change the narrative. Also, we are talking about low intensity activities or the potential development of some activities. So. So this is the sleep, sleep dot analysis, not SWOT analysis. We got the results. And for instance, I just want to say to share with you some of our results. There are defined the areas of strength. And this is the university leadership, for instance, students, academicians, university uh, engagement, culture, university centers. And just to, 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 to present to you some of, uh, of the comments we actually uh, got, for instance, we are very happy that the experts uh, noticed that, there, that, our, that uh, at our university there is a strong leadership support for the community engagement concept, and this is really our strategic, strategic choice. Also, there are notice there that at the university we have a very strong engagement culture and this is not and that, that this culture is actually authentical so this is not the formal fulfillment of some formal conditions or indicators but this is this is very important for us that it is perceived that our mission and our community engage idea is authentical also, it is noticed as our strength university centers as really unique practice. And I'm happy that uh, the experts uh, actually uh, perceived and registered impressive works of our centers. But also, we got uh, uh, the very precise analysis of areas of, uh, of lower intensity or the potential, what is actually the potential for the development. And you can see here also that we have the leadership and the policy element, uh, research, uh, university centers. And just to show with you some of, of the comments we got, for instance, concerning the leadership and the po policy, uh, they said to us that we are good. We, they noticed our, our enthusiasm, but they said that we need to think about the sustainability, you know, of, of the uh, uh, community engagement activities. So this is very, very important for us. Also, uh, they, they suggested... Uh, they suggested to us to try to, to move, uh, to spread our activities from the center to the periphery. So we are now very much aware that we need to invest a lot of energy, not just to present the idea of the community engagement, but try to mobilize and uh, sense, uh, to, to spread the sensibility enthusiasm to our, to our researchers. Also, they are suggested to us that probably we can brand it, you know, our, the, our university as the community engaged university in accordance with our, uh, with our uh, uh, results. 
And finally, I just want to, to, sh to share with you the conclusions, our conclusions after all at the university with, uh, uh, between the all stakeholders, we definitely registered and recognized this toolbox as a comprehensive, very detailed, you know, uh, very sensitive on the context so very participative so they try with So that is not the sound is not only in your in your connection. Let's hope that we can move on to the conclusions. So the image is uh, frozen. Yes, um, Nino, I wonder if you can help us out. Perhaps you know while we are trying to fix Snyasnana's uh, 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 connection. So maybe you can come in. Do you know what the conclusions are? I, we can't hear you. Can you either. hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? OK, yeah. sorry. So maybe just to briefly conclude that, uh, yes, so the toolbox is comprehensive enough. It allows for context-specific application. Uh, so there is no, like, it's not framed as one size fits all. It's participative and allows participants to have a meaningful say in the process. The process is holistic uh, and developmental, which means that it does not result in a narrow scoring exercise. And the institutions, as we've heard from the rector, uh, learns a lot in the process about potential for improvement. Thank you very much. Tia? Thank you, Nino, for saving the day. In the meantime, we are trying to fix the, the connection with uh, with Nana so that we can ask her questions as well. I, I I bring to you one question that came up in the in the um, the chat box while you were saying that uh, this is not uh, a ranking exercise. Someone is asking, uh, how is this different from a ranking exercise? Uh, if you anyway have the kind of the grading systems and so on. Yeah, and how yeah. can uh, you get the data away from the self-evaluation? So maybe maybe it is really like connected to one of the principles that I have uh, explained. And uh, this is like bottom up rather than top down steering, because basically uh, our toolbox is based on mapping stories of practitioners. So uh, it really results in a qualitative discovery of good practices, uh, which is then very much different than the indicator approach. And uh, I saw that somebody in the chat mentioned uh, you multi-rank. Um, and uh, you multi-rank is definitely like a very thorough uh, university assessment. Um, uh, and it uh, takes really considerable uh, resources uh, at the university to implement it. While our approach uh, is, as I said, uh, more on a qualitative side, uh, and uh, really we believe that they empower individuals and to share stories that it produces, as we have seen at the University of Rijeka, very good results. Tia? Okay. Um can community engagement promote employability skills among among the students? Of course, I think that uh, community engagement could take uh, different forms. And uh, we always stress that it is context specific. And context is always very different for uh, different universities. So definitely the answer is yes. OK, there was a there was a slip dot Someone is asking, what does that <laughs> stand for? Well, yeah, this is uh, uh, another name that we have developed for SWOT because we do not mm -hmm. want to use weakness, but then rather, you know, uh, areas uh, for uh, lower intensity, so not to be on a negative, but on uh, a positive side. Okay, yes. So it's a playing with the it, words. It, <laughs> it's a part, actually, uh, it's one of the... Uh, uh, step in the implementation of the framework. Okay. Um, then the, we still don't have this. No, no, I'm trying to pick. So I understand that the community engagement framework is available online, is it? 
Yeah, it Are is what? available, but maybe maybe I can just mention because we now all live in this Corona crisis. And I think that uh, it's interesting because we know that we need to act uh, now as an interdependent community, not like independent individuals or maybe insulated universities. So the values of um, excellence and economic dynamism and efficiency have been really joined by those uh, of solidarity, fairness, responsibility and compassion. And I really believe that this change will create new opportunity for community engagement. Okay, yeah. so Siana, unfortunately, we lost you when you were getting to your conclusions, but uh, Nino stepped in and uh, um, I know that you had prepared the presentation together, so he knew what you were uh, about to say. I see we have a lot of questions about the, the, the topic in, in the chat box and we can get back to those also in the, later on, but uh, Nino uh, referred to the coronavirus situation. Uh, and I know that University of Rijeka is, uh, it's, it's the community engagement is in the core of the university. How, how, is, how do you see the impact of the virus in your, in your commitment to community engagement? Is it more important or less important as you are trying to solve all the other challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Tia, for, for, for the question. So uh, at the university, we would like, you know, to keep um, as much normality as we can and also in the domain of community engagement activities. So in this framework, let us say, of the new uh, uh, normalities, actually, we discovered that actually some of our community engaged activities, let us say, is actually even intensify. For instance, in our center for uh, advanced communication, computing we have the, the supercomputer you know so our sciences and our researchers actually do uh, work on that especially concerning the COVID-19 you know so the predictions so some testing uh, our uh, experts in the virusology actually you know working on that also our our network of volunteers you know also uh, it is kind of test for for us you know for for the community so many of our students and actually our employees the professor the researcher academicians actually to our volunteer networks help not only to our older professor you know but also to, to the community so we actually uh, can say that some of our practices actually our connections with the communities testing at this very very complicated complicated uh, 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 time o of course you know it's uh, we try to transform and to adapt all of our activities to to, to the new normality so online uh, or, yeah. or, uh, or online functioning so definitely it's the challenge for us but uh, you know we strongly you know keep try to keep you know our our um, you know uh, orientation to to be as community engaged as we can yeah. okay thank you Nino very quickly we need to move on yeah. Yeah, I would just say that community engagement really tends to be locally oriented. And as our digital and local lives expand and our physical and global ones contract, I would say that this is also change, that this change will create new opportunities for community engagement. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, we need to move on. We'll come back and some of the questions will be answered. And also, I mean, if you feel like it, you can already, you know, try to answer some of them in the chat box about the, the availability of the framework and so on. Um, but we move on to another way of uh, societal engagement of universities. Uh, many universities around Europe are working on the on uh, supporting the scholars at risk and um, um, and uh, academic freedom through those uh, those actions. And Orla has been working on uh, prom uh, coordinating one of the one project uh, that has been supporting the universities. And you're going to talk to us about that experience. So I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you, Tia, and um, thank you, Nino and Shnesnana, for a really ent interesting presentation. And to all of you listening and attending online, I hope you are all keeping well and, and staying safe. Um, today, I'm just going to give you a, a quick overview of how universities across Europe are coming together 
to support and welcome researchers at risk to their institutions and also promote academic freedom. Um, I'm going to touch on the work, obviously, of the Scholars at Risk Network, which is open to any institution or individual that shares the commitment and values of promoting academic freedom and protecting threatened scholars globally. Um, I'll also look at briefly some of those challenges um, pre the pandemic and now the, the additional layers of issues that the pandemic is, is, is throwing up. And I will also then look at some of the initiatives that, that universities are taking, particularly the Inspire Europe project that Tia mentioned that is running now for the next two years, um, which is aiming to strengthen support across Europe for researchers at risk. And then lastly, I'll end with a call to action for those who are interested in taking, um, it ta who has interest in this area and taking some actions forward. So as I mentioned, Scholars at Risk um, Europe is hosted at Maynooth University here in Ireland, uh, and it reflects Maynooth University's strong commitment to the principle of academic freedom and recognising that it's an essential precondition to world-class to world research. Um, Scholars at Risk globally is a network made up of 500 institutions across 40 countries. And Scholars at Risk Europe is the coordinator of the European dimension of that, which involves 300 member universities and including national sections in 11 European countries. And as I mentioned, SAR Europe at, Uni at Maynooth University is also the uh, coordinator of the Inspire Europe project funded under Horizon 2020, which I'll discuss shortly. But the overall aim of Scholars at Risk Europe is to strengthen the collective voice and contribute to informed policymaking at a European level that leads to greater protection of scholars and promotes academic freedom worldwide. So the approaches that are taken by the scholar at, Scholars at Risk Network, there's three key areas. And these relate to protection, advocacy, and learning. And within protection, the key area is providing positions of sanctuary for scholars who are at risk uh, in their home countries and need to possibly flee uh, and, have a, and, and maintain their career prospects. So my thanks to those who are attending from universities that are currently hosting scholars and welcome, of course, additional universities that may be interested in the future on hosting a scholar. And please do reach out to me or to the wider Scholars at Risk Network if you're interested in potentially hosting a scholar in the future. Ideally, we would look for positions that are one semester or a year or ideally longer if that was possible from your institution. And um, the next area around advocacy, there's a number of areas that universities are working on this with the support of Scholars at Risk. Uh, the first one is the Academic Freedom Monitoring Project. This is um, supported by mainly volunteer researchers globally who monitor six key areas of attacks and issues of threat on academia and, and scholars worldwide. And that culminates annually in the Scholars at Risk Free to Think report. And the 2019 report is available on the Scholars at Risk website. The 2020 report will be launched later this year, possibly around November, um, and keep an eye out on the website for, for more details on that. There's also Scholars in Prison project, and this is where uh, our members across the network write and advocate on support of students and scholars that are now wrongfully imprisoned. And we've had a number of um, successful campaigns in this and recent activities by institutions based in Sweden and in Italy have taken on the cases of former students that are now wrongfully imprisoned and they have actively engaged on their behalf. And the last area is around learning. And this is a biannual Congress that SAR organizes. Unfortunately, it was due to happen this year in Baltimore and Washington in the United States, but had to move online. But the good news is those really interesting um, sessions are available on the Scholars at Risk website. And if you are interested in this area, please do go online and, and view those. The other area is um, an online MOOC course on academic freedom, which was developed as part of the uh, Academic Refuge Project with the University of Oslo. 
and another intake of that course has just opened up this week and it's available on the Future Learn platform if you are interested. And then lastly is the SAR speaker series and this is now again moved virtually and this is where a scholar can come and speak online to your faculty, to your department, to your student group or any organization that's interested in this topic and talk about their own experiences and how you can work with the scholars at risk network to take this issue of, of threatened scholars and academic freedom forward. And I suppose all of this work really aligns itself quite well to a number of institutional strategies universities are taking. Uh, the first one being a refugee integration strategy and even linked to that, there is a, uh, the university sanctuary status as well, the number of universities ha have. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work around diversity, equality and inclusion, and that is also available. Um, so that is, sorry, excuse me. Um, so that is also available um, as an as a entry point for people who are interested in taking academic freedom forward. Also institutionalization or internationalization at home and many universities have a policy on academic freedom. So if your university has these already, these can be used as an entry point to engage on the wider approaches that the Scholars at Risk Network are taking. I mentioned earlier about some of the challenges and just briefly, I know we don't have much time, but just to say the Scholars at Risk, the recent report has document, documented 324 attacks. And these are the six areas I mentioned earlier uh, on the left hand side. And these have unfortunately have increased from last year, um, last year's figures um, on the status of, of attacks against, on, against academics globally, where, which it was um, 294 attacks in 47 countries. So unfortunately, we're seeing a rise in attacks globally against academic communities. And then these have included uh, violent attacks, and these can be by state and private, private uh, security forces and also wrongful imprisonment, usually using uh, terrorism legislation as well. And as I mentioned, obviously, we're in the context of COVID-19. And some of the issues we're seeing springing up on this are relating to uh, some countries are using the security or the issue of the pandemic to crack down on, on human rights activists. Also, European countries in many places have suspended asylum procedures. And this affects can affect scholars who are trying to flee their own countries in terms of trying to get access to a European country to take up a position, but it can also affect those who are currently in positions in Europe about taking up future positions. And all of this means that its additional support is needed for hosted scholars and our thanks again to those universities that are hosting scholars and have done a lot of work at the moment around this and around extensions um, to scholars in their position. So our continued thanks to you for that. Just briefly to give you an overview of, of the supports that Scholars at Risk have provided. So in the last academic year, we received 581 applications for assistance. And they are the, as you can see on the right hand side, that is the, the countries of origin for those um, applicants. And then the scholar, the disciplines they have come from. And lastly, I'll just talk about the Inspire Europe project. Um, this is a 10 partner project that will run until um, August 2022. Uh, there's a number, most of the partners are from an academic background, but we do have non-academic partners as well. And it really has six key areas that we're trying to advance over the next two years. The first one relates to uh, developing a long-term sustainable cross-sectoral cross European support structure and we envisage this as a, a, a strong coordinating committee made up of representatives who want to take this issue forward uh, for the duration of the project, but ongoing also. And the next area is around policy making across Europe to increase support for researchers at risk. We are doing a mapping exercise at the moment in terms of both researchers at risk themselves, but also higher education institutions on what are the challenges they find in promoting and supporting researchers at risk. And following that, we will ultimately be doing a, a recommendations report to take this whole area forward. The next area is bridging the gaps between national and European support structures. 
there's a number of countries that have done a lot of work in supporting scholars and, and researchers at risk. And we can also learn, hopefully, from newer initiatives and also from other sectors, NGOs, private sector, government departments, and how we can come together to build ideas and to strengthen alliances and approaches to support researchers at risk. The next area is to support career development for researchers at risk. And we are doing this through a pilot scheme of one-to-one -one coaching to support researchers who may want to take up fellowships or avail of other European research funding. And we are also providing a series of webinars which are available on our website. The next area is around pre preparing the work environment in academic and non-academic sectors. And this is around supporting higher education institutions, but also non-academic organizations who would like to support and employ a researcher at risk. And the final area is about growing the network of support um, in Europe, but a particular focus on Central and Southern Eastern and Southern, uh, sorry, Central, Eastern and Southern Europe. And two of our partners, one is based in Greece and one is based in Poland with the idea of using their networks um, to create awareness and to build a larger network that can support researchers at risk. So lastly, just as a call to action in relation to Inspire Europe, as I mentioned, we are having a consultation process at the moment, um, which is being led by EUA, which is also one of our partners. And you can find that um, survey for higher education institutes and also researchers at risk. There's two separate surveys that's on their website at the moment, and the deadline is May 1st for the completion of that. We're also having our own stakeholder forum on June 8th online, and the registration will open shortly for that on the Inspire Europe website, and the link is there in the presentation. And you can also view previous webinars on the Inspire Europe um, website. And please do email inspireeurope at mu.ie or contact me directly to be added to the Inspire Europe mailing list. And the last area is more wider scholars at risk work. As I mentioned, there is the Dangerous Questions, Why Academic Freedom Matters, the online course that you can avail of for your faculty, your staff, students, anyone who is interested in this area. We also like to engage students through the SAR advocacy seminars and also through the uh, Scholars in Prison project. And lastly, you can invite a scholar to speak to your faculty, to your department, to your students on their own experiences and how important academic freedom is globally. And that's a service that you can also request um, through the network. So lastly, just to thank you all. Thank you, EUA, for this opportunity. And thank you all for your time. And my contact details are there. And please do send any questions through the chat. Thank you, Orla. Actually, with your last slide, you answered some of the questions that uh, were posted in the chat box so I don't have to repeat them anymore how to get involved or and so on so you right. can uh, like and in apologies for the interruption <laughs> <laughs> um, you can um, get in touch with Orla if you want to know practicalities but in in general what uh, the you you mentioned some of the big challenges for the scholars at risk at the moment in this uh, cor coronavirus times but uh, what is the challenge? Is the, uh, what is the challenge for your activities? Are you finding more difficult to get uh, your voice heard or the uh, getting attention to the to this issue at the moment when everyone is frantically fixing everything else? Yeah, I think there is. I suppose there's a growing awareness that the. Obviously, there was the initial stages of the pandemic and the lockdown, but I think there's a growing awareness that in certain countries it's being used yeah. for other means. And also within Europe now, the issue of the closing of borders and now with the US decision uh, recently as well around immigration, I think it's shining a light on this wider issue. And I think slowly and slowly it's it's because people are becoming more aware of the unintended consequences yeah. of what's going on and i think it's up to us and the network and the various universities that are involved i know everyone is dealing with multitudes of issues in terms of in a university setting alone but it's also incumbent on us to to make 
it known out there that what's happening is also being used for other reasons and the issues that closing borders has on people who are at risk and trying to flee a situation is hugely detrimental and I suppose it's it's to, to just to keep shining a light and to keep creating awareness on this. Yes, I think it's in general the both presentations have very much um, underlined the fact that uh, in particular in these times societal engagement is important. Universities uh, need to do that in different uh, ways but, exactly. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to show our value to the society. Exactly. Uh, maybe, at, yeah. maybe at this time I will invite uh, Nino and uh, Snezhiana to join us and uh, activate their microphones and uh, video so that we can have a conversation together. Um, is there maybe to make a link between the two presentations? Uh, I would have a question to Nino if uh, only we got him back. Um, but apparently we don't. It takes a while actually in this uh, in this system for the it's, videos to it's, activate. It's just Nana now, I think. Yeah, I still see you for a while. Um, there was a, well, I'm going to already ask a question that I think uh, Snezhnyana can answer first. There was a question er earlier, I'll make the link later. But there was a question earlier about the, the framework appearing theoretic and the materials uh, appearing theoretic and uh, be, uh, there was a request for some practical examples. Uh, uh, from the University of Rijeka perspective, was it theoretic or is it practical to use? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. But uh, thank you very much for, 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 for the asking. You know, we would like, you know, to be, um, you know, uh, 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 we, we need to, to consult also also the theories. So let us say the documents, the European policies, when we are thinking about the, uh, our university and what, what to do. So uh, I think that um, actually, you know, there is an ideology of the third generation, third gen universities of the third or even four generations so now it's very let us say popular we had you know at the first you know the university completely devoted to the education then the research universities then we now have you know this very complicated and disputable ranking systems concerning all of that so this, the universities of the third generation or even four generations universities completely that belong to the community, you know. So the, the universities who are very well connected, not only with the community in the wider sense, you know, so not local local uh, authorities, uh, business, entrepreneurship, and the citizens. So we definitely, you know, perceives uh, our universities, university that would like, you know, to be engaged, you know. There is a kind of uh, idea that NGOs are engaged, you know. There is the, the, the activists, the people, individuals that are engaged, but not the institutions, not the public institutions. So we would like to be engaged, you know. So we would like, you know, to belong to our community and belong to the region and belong to the international, not only national, national community. So this is our ideology to have, you know, the virtuous, virtuous institutions, you know, engaged institutions. So we would like to transform all of these ideas, you know, in the practice, of course, in the framework of academicians, researchers, experts, you know, how to transform and to give, to spread our expertise to, to the people. Nino, what would you say? Is your framework theoretical? Uh, I think that the question that we had in the chat uh, was uh, more about materials that are available on yeah. our uh, tepsi.eu uh, website, which uh, basically do not contain yet uh, the reports of the piloting at the University of Rijeka, University of Twente in Netherlands, uh, Technical University in Dublin and Technical University of uh, Dresden. So I would just like to say that we will uh, put all these piloting reports uh, on the website very soon, but the reports are still uh, actually in the process of being created. So, uh, and then um, uh, our colleagues will have uh, more information, but I would say, no, I think that the, um, uh, our framework is really very, very practical uh, because it really takes uh, stories 
of uh, individual uh, practitioners at the universities. Uh, so it is really very much down to the earth uh, and people really talk through our framework about different engagement practices, which then basically encourages other to be more engaged. And then it encourages also not only individuals, but then also management structures to make it uh, basically more um, widespread uh, uh, and to create more system out of it at the university. Tia? Thank you. Um uh, maybe for Orla first, there's a question in the in the chat box that do you believe that the social engagement strategy of universities is part of their contribution in the democratic culture of the societies? Is there wow. a yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, I, I, as I mentioned in the in the, the presentation, I think a lot of what scholars at risk and the work we are doing and, and through the Inspire in Europe project as well aligns very closely to the societal engagement plans of universities and a lot of the work around uh, whether it is engagement with refugee communities or whether it is more on the internationalization of staffing and also of curriculum, but also that inherent commitment to academic freedom as being a value that is held closely by a university and should be maintained. Um, and I know in many places it's under threat, but that, that commitment itself is, is critical to allowing uh, universities then to, to take wider engagement on the issues that are uh, at, at playing in the, the minds of, of scholars at risk and academics globally who are under threat and researchers at risk that are under threat and to enable them to also to come to take up positions but also it's a two-way street you know that the the learning and and the experience that those researchers and scholars can provide for an institution as well at a european level is also an added value to a university. So it's, it's, it really is a, a mutual learning process. Do you think, uh, Ms. Nesiana, that your university is contributing to the democratic culture in the society? We would like, you know, to think about ourselves that we really contribute because we are very much devoted to this idea of developing the democratic competences uh, at the tertiary, tertiary education. You know, we have a lot of debate about, you know, the culture of ignorance at this very moment, about all these, you know, societal uh, radicalization all over the world, in Europe, but definitely all over the world. So we definitely perceive, you know, our role as uh, one of very important stakeholder uh, in the dis discussion, but not discussion, but the changing and the coping with all these challenges. For instance, our universities um, uh, uh, is in the platform Universities for Enlightenment, actually uh, initiated uh, by, by the uh, Austrian Austrian University. So we would like to participate more in the, you know, developing and the debating about the democratic culture, what democracy really is, you know, what is the difference between the populism and uh, uh and the democracy and then to contribute actively in the changing and and contributing to the development of democratic culture thank you very much for this question this issue is definitely you know very important in the context of the community engaged universities yeah i will continue with you there is another question about how to reconcile the your community engagement uh, uh, which is very much into the flexibility and being local with the idea of a European university initiative. And you did mention in your presentation that your university is part of one of these initiatives. So yeah. do you see there being any kind of uh, uh, conflict or are these compatible with each other? Yeah, actually, thank you very much. I noticed this this question and the comment in the yeah. chat. I, I appreciate very much about that. Yeah, we are we are the, the member of the UFE, Young Universities for Future of Europe Network. And actually, one of the, the biggest and the most important uh, working package in our our uh, alliance is the UFE, UFE in the cities. 
you know, completely devoted to the community engagement practices. Oh. So we would like also to spread this idea of TEFTSE in our uh, uh, European University network. So concerning the COVID situation, actually, we need to postpone, you know, our presentation, but we would like definitely to be to be one of the leading partner in this uh, in this area. So uh, thank you for this question. I think that probably it's not, I, I do not perceive the tension, but actually the opportunity in that that, you know, to spread this idea because the European University as, uh, initiative is actually meant, you know, how to engage the, the university from the different parts of the Europe. So now, you know, together we will be, you know, definitely, you know, uh, more, more ready to rethink and think about the community engagement uh, of the universities. Nino, a little bit to follow up to you as well. Uh, you are, uh, you work on community engagement but you want to work on it at European level. What's yes, the added value? Uh, because I think that uh, there is really a need to uh, support uh, like uh, uh, European universities uh, and to offer them uh, one platform which we see in the form of a European framework that could support their efforts in institutionalizing their links with the wider uh, community. So, uh, um, uh, the, the the very 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 good question is basically who will who could be in charge of the framework once we will produce it at the end of this year of this European uh, framework. So uh, this is the open question, and I'm really uh, looking forward in the chat if uh, any uh, um, there, if there is any proposal how we could uh, find a solution that uh, basically institutions uh, use the framework and maybe that there is somebody who will be in charge of uh, helping them. Um, so, but maybe to come to the previous point, uh, I think that uh, this, uh, uh, this interplay between uh, local uh, and the global, I think that when we speak about the uh, engagement or community engagement, uh, and I said that this is context specific, uh, and uh, um, I think that uh, it always depends, you know, on the profile of the university. And our framework has uh, showed that uh, it can be flexible enough. And uh, engagement, uh, I don't know, for Harvard is really global. But then we see on the example of the University of Rijeka that it is also it can be locally um, uh, adopted. So I would say that, that we somehow succeeded uh, in uh, providing this flexibility within the framework. Tia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have I'm come to realize that we're running out of time here, but I'm picking up one more question for Orla. Uh, how do we raise awareness among students of the current threats uh, in some countries to academic freedom and open scholarship? Uh, mm -hmm. Is our students somehow uh, part of your your work and how could we do this oh, oh most definitely it. yeah no most definitely so so today scholars at risk have a number of initiatives so a big one is the and i i should have explained it a bit more in depth in the presentation is the 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 student advocacy and, and legal clinics and this provides an opportunity for faculty staff and students to work together with scholars at risk to give them human rights um, training and advocacy skills which will so they will take on a particular area and they can help and do the um, the monitoring of the attacks on global communities globally they can also help participate and take on a specific case relating to the scholars in prison project so it, it can also develop into course credit if they're interested in that or it can be just an, an activity and a project they do as part of their studies but we have done that a lot with a lot of um, universities a lot of faculties so it enables students get skills and expertise in certain areas that they're interested in but it also helps in terms of documenting issues and threats globally so it's a, a, again it's an interesting uh, partnership arrangement so that's definitely one area I would encourage students as well to do the online MOOC on academic freedom and also inviting a scholar to speak to students directly is a really really good initiative in terms of hearing that first-hand account of what happened to them and their situation and how important academic freedom is globally 
So I think there's a number of activities there that can really engage students on. Okay, thank you. That was very practical uh, advice mm -hmm. and hopefully some, uh, some participants got some ideas from it. We are approaching the end of our webinar. Uh, as said, this was just the beginning. This we are very aware that we were not able to go into much uh, in depth here in this uh, in this session. Um, it is up to it. What is left is uh, basically for me to uh, thank you everyone for joining us for the participants and uh, also th uh, extreme thank yous for the speakers of our session for their willingness to make room for uh, for for this session and talk about talk to us about these extremely important matters which are still very much uh, on the university agendas and i do want to remind everyone that we do have one more webinar that will be part of our annual conference uh, Coming up uh, on Friday, it will be talking. Uh, it will be about making a difference through partnerships. So, if you have not signed up, uh, please do so. And you will be getting some uh, further materials in the uh, through an email. Uh, some of you asked about it, so uh, the presentations and some some more will be coming up. Um, thank you once again to my our speakers.